Hi and welcome to our 17th class. From today, we start chapter 7 on traffic control and analysis at signalized intersections. The major change that we experience now is that we are moving from uninterrupted flow facilities to interrupted flow facilities. We start talking about signalized intersections. We will have a traffic light that either stops or allow the traffic stream to continue. In this class, we start with a lot of concepts, definitions, and gradually we get to learn how to analyze a signalized intersection. Let's get going. On this slide, I would like to talk about three main definitions uh, that we are going to use over and over in this chapter. The first one is the definition of an intersection. It's when two or more roadways cross each other at the same grade. And this word at grade is the key word here. So if you have one roadway that crosses the other one, not at the same level, like an interchange that you see on a freeway, that's not going to be the focus of this chapter. So intersections are at grade crossing of two or multiple roadways. The other definition is the definition of approach. Approach is a single or group of multiple lanes uh, that are used by vehicles to enter the intersection. So think about an intersection of two roadways and each of those roadways are one way. In such an example, you have two approaches because vehicles use two different places to enter the intersection. If you have an intersection of two two-way streets, then you would have four approaches as vehicles are using four different places to enter the intersection. The other definition that I would like to cover on this slide is the definition of lane groups. So a lane group is either a single or multiple lanes that are allowed to go through the intersection at the same time and usually these lanes are served by the same phase and they have the same uh, saturation flow rate to process vehicles. We talk about lane groups further later in this chapter. What I have on this slide is a layout of an intersection. So you can see that this is intersection or crossing of two roadways each of those each of these roadways are two-way so what we have here is four approaches as you can see on the uh, figure by approach one two three and four and for a few minutes I would like to focus on approach three Here you can see that I have two lanes and a left lane pocket. So if I want to talk about lane groups, here I have three lane groups. One lane group is this group of vehicles that are making a left turn. The other group is this group of lanes that are going through. And the last one is this group on the right that are either going through or making a right turn. Now you need to uh, keep in mind that this lane is a shared through and right lane. So let's focus on approach one. Here also I have three lane groups. While if you take a look at the number of lanes and pockets together, those are four. So one lane group here is making a right turn. The other lane group is for vehicles that are making a left turn. And then these two lanes are grouped together. And this is a lane group 
for those lanes that are used for vehicles to go through the intersection. So here I still have three lane groups. On this figure also you can see the stop bar, you can see turn base, uh, you can see pedestrian crossing, you can see medians and uh, other things at an intersection. I would like for you to take a look at this figure and think and think about things that make the analysis of this intersection challenging. So for a few seconds think about think about things um, that create complications in analyzing what is going on in this intersection. For instance, if you think about this intersection, you will see a lot of pedestrians that are uh, present in the intersection neighborhood. So the interactions that they have with vehicular movement is gonna create complications. Another thing that you can see here is the number of taxis that are present. So why do you think taxis are going to create complications because they're going to stop to pick up or drop off uh, passengers so that's going to create some disruption to traffic flow when you go through the intersection how about uh, other things you can see that uh, this lane is closed here there is some construction happening in this intersection so that is going to create that is going to close one of the lanes so not only one lane is closed now vehicles upstream of that lane need to plan for future and they need to pretty much change their lane so you really see a couple of complications there one lane is closed and then you're going to have some unplanned lane changes in this intersection if you also take a look at this side, you can see that a number of vehicles are parked. So does that create any complication? The answer is yes. These vehicles, when they want to park, they're going to block one of the lanes for some time. When they want to get out of the parking spot, they're going to do the same. And that's going to create uh, some problem and you're going to lose uh, some of the capacity of the intersection and there are other things like that that you can see here that makes the analysis of a signalized intersection a very complicated task so here i would like for you to think about some of the advantages of signalization or think about why we would like to install signals at an intersection uh, rather than having stop signs or other forms of controlling the traffic. So what are some advantages that we hope to achieve from signalization? And I would like for you guys to, to pause the video here for a few seconds and think about it and then uh, continue with the video. So if you think about one of the most advantages of signalization is the reduction of some types of crashes. So why do we put signals at an intersection? Because we don't want two movements that have a conflict to go through the intersection at the same time. Think about a vehicle that is going from north to south and a vehicle that goes from east to west. If they enter the intersection at the same time, there is, a hard, there is a high chance for a crash. So if a signal is done properly, it's going to reduce or eliminate the probability of these types of crashes. A good signal can help pedestrians to cross the streets 
at the intersection so it's it will provide them with enough time to pass uh, the streets safely also it can provide the possibility for traffic from side street to enter the traffic stream and go through the arterial or go through the intersection think about an intersection of a major and a minor street where you control the traffic with stop signs on the minor streets it's hard for traffic from minor street to either cross or join the traffic on the major street if you just have stop signs a properly timed traffic signal allows the traffic from side streets to uh, enter or cross the intersection safely and efficiently signals also if they are done the right way can provide possibility for coordinate for coordination of green lights so that when you go through an intersection or when you go through an arterial through several intersections you hit or you arrive at each intersection when the traffic light is green and not red if you think about that when you go through downtown raleigh um, if you are going from north to south in the morning the signals are very well coordinated and after uh, your signal turns green you have a good chance of going through several intersections without stopping and the vice versa is true when you're going out or when you're going uh, to north through downtown in in the evening peak So if signals are done properly, they can improve capacity and also they can reduce the delay. But what if signals are not done properly? So what are the disadvantages of signalization if they are not done properly? So pretty much whatever you saw on the previous slide, you can think about those as a disadvantage. So you can increase vehicle delay. You may increase some other types of crashes. For example, rather than rather than having T-bone crashes, now you can have rear end crashes. If the signals are not done properly, rather than having a green wave or signal coordination, you may cause vehicles to stop at each intersection when they are going through an arterial. And if that is happening, you are pretty much encouraging traffic not to use that arterial and take some other routes that are not intended for that level of traffic. So that's also a disadvantage. So let's assume that in a perfect world, we can design signals perfectly and we are going to have all the advantages and none of the disadvantages in such a world are we going to put signals at each intersection the answer is no and if you want to know what is the reason the reason is the cost signalization is expensive if you think about typical cost to just install all the hardware and software that is required for signalization at a typical intersection that is in the excess of $100,000. And we have many intersections, most of which are not signalized. So for that reason, there are a number of warrants that need to be met so that we as traffic engineers go and install signals at the intersection and those warrants are listed in the manual on uniform traffic control devices or MUTCD and there are a number of those warrants that deal with volume, pedestrian volume, school crossing, signal coordination and crash experience that is going to justify together the need for installing a signal. We are not going to go through those 
in this course but in a follow-up course uh, we will visit them so I also want to have a note on the queue links there are two concepts that I want to talk about one is spillover and the other one is and the other one is spill back and one of the things that we want to do with signals and with properly designed and timed signals is that we want to eliminate spillovers or spillbacks so here in this figure I'm showing you spillover you're seeing that the queue on the left lane pocket has is has increased and spilled back to the true lane so what it is doing now is that it blocks the true lane and those two blue cars that want to make a left turn are gonna stop there and pretty much block the entire traffic to go through the true lane while you have enough capacity or enough space left on the true lane so you're gonna have starvation uh, when the signal is green we want to eliminate that spillback also needs to be eliminated so now you will see that the true traffic queue is long and it is pretty much past the pocket the left turn pocket so that blue car that is left here doesn't have a chance to join this lane and go through the intersection uh, if there is enough gap or if there is a left turn uh, arrow for that movement so the queue from true movement is spilled back and has pretty much eliminated the possibility of that car to join the left turn pocket we want to eliminate that so a properly designed signal should eliminate both spill back and spill over I have more definitions that uh, I would like to share with you we have indication so here in this figure you're seeing a red indication so what are we going to have at a signalized intersection we can have a green indication we can have yellow indication and red indication interval is a period of time when all the signal indications are the same or you don't see any change in any signal indication at the intersection cycle is one complete sequence of signal indications for example in the signal head that we are seeing here if the green starts at t equal to zero and then stays green for let's say 50 seconds then it turns yellow for five seconds and then turns to red for 20 seconds after 75 seconds which is the summation of 50 plus 5 plus 20 we are going to see the green illuminated on this signal head again that is defined a cycle and that 75 seconds is defined as cycle lengths so we show cycle lengths with capital C green time with capital G yellow time with capital Y red time with capital R and all red time with capital A and capital R can you think about the need for for all red time why do we use all red well we use all red to allow vehicles that enter the intersection before the signal turn red to clear the intersection so we show red signals to all different movements so that no one comes in and those that are inside the intersection can leave can you think of a typical duration for all red it's usually between one and two intersections and the duration also depends on the width of intersections 
or streets. So on this slide, I would like to talk about different types of controllers or control logics that we use at signalized intersections. You see three different controllers, pre-timed, semi-actuated, or fully actuated control. So pre-timed are those controllers that the timing is given to them. And the timing can change from, let's say, morning peak to evening peak. But during each period, it is fixed. If you have more vehicles arriving during that period, signal timing does not change. If you have fewer vehicles arriving during that period, still signal timing does not change. So everything is fixed during a period. We have semi-actuated. In the semi-actuated, some of the streets are equipped with vehicle detectors. And when they detect a vehicle, they're going to provide green time for that movement. And when the vehicle is gone, the green time is going to expire. We also have fully actuated control. When you have detectors on all movements, and then the controller is going to provide green times based on detection on each of those detectors. So here you see the definitions. Pre-timed, as I mentioned, the signal timing does not change and it's fixed during a specific period of time. Now you can have different fixed signal timing in the morning, in the evening, in the noon time. Semi-actuated, so you have detectors on some approaches, and those detectors are going to detect vehicle, and based on the detection, they're going to provide signal to different movements. So if you think about a semi-actuated, I want you to think about uh, some of the conditions that a semi-actuated control could be very useful. And that is when you have a major street intersecting a minor street. So here I'm showing you this major street and then here I have the minor street. So if you have a major street, what you can do is that you can put detectors on the minor street. And what happens here is that we are going to provide the green time always to the major street unless there is a detection in one of these detectors. If there is detection, the signal is going to switch and we are going to provide green to the minor street. And when there is no more vehicles detected, the signal is going to go back or the green is going to go back to the major street. Fully actuated. So in fully actuated, as I mentioned before, we are going to have vehicle detectors on all different movements. So what is going to happen there is that vehicle detectors are going to detect the presence of the vehicle and based on the volume, they're going to uh, allocate green to different movements. So usually what happens here is that Traffic engineer determines a minimum green to each approach. So when there is detection, that minimum green is going to be provided. So if one vehicle is there or five vehicles, that minimum green is going to be given. Now, if the detector keeps detecting more vehicles, that green duration is going to be extended. More vehicles detected over time, the green is going to be extended over and over. Let's say two seconds extension is going to be provided if you see more vehicles passing over the detector. So two things is going to happen. Either there is enough vehicle that the green time is going to keep extending until it reaches a pre-specified maximum green time. 
at that time the green is gonna be terminated or the detector does not detect a vehicle for some time for a predefined duration of time so there is a gap between vehicle arrivals and at that time the signal is going to be terminated so if the signal gets to its maximum or the green time gets to its maximum and is terminated we say the signal is maxed out if the signal does not get to its maximum and is terminated because there was a large gap between vehicle arrival we say the green phase is gapped out so think about it either the green the green phase is going to be maxed out or gapped out so when a green phase in a fully actuated system will be maxed out when you have a lot of demand there and the maximum green is not enough to process all the demand when is it going to be gapped out when the demand is not high enough and sometime after the minimum green there is enough gap in the traffic on this slide um, we are seeing six loop detectors that are installed on a freeway facility uh, it's, just, it's pretty much the same thing on, on intersections too. Here you see six uh, rectangles or pretty much six feet by six feet squares. So we make tiny cuts on the pavement. We lay down the wire and then we cover it with epoxy or something like that. And then the electricity is going to go through the, the, the wires and as a result is going to create a magnetic field. Uh, and when vehicles go through that field because they uh, are, are having a lot of metal, they're going to create disruption in the field and the detector can detect that disruption. And that's how a vehicle is, uh, is detected on, on any, any of these loop detectors. So again, uh, on this slide, we talk about um, a typical phase operations in actuated control we have an initial green or a minimum green and then based on vehicle detection that green is extended either to the maximum green when it is going to be maxed out or uh, if there is not enough traffic demand that is detected by the detectors we are going to have a gap out situation and uh, green extension is going to be stopped before hitting the maximum green. On this slide, we are looking at a dual ring configuration. And this is pretty much the way that uh, traffic engineers show the phasing sequence or the possible or the possible phase sequences at a signalized intersections. Here we have a intersection of two two-way streets and um, we are showing the dual uh, ring configuration here but before going through that first we need to talk about uh, how we have named these different movements so you see wbl ebl and things like that so if you look at one intersection that i'm going to draw here The, knee, the way that uh, we name the movements is based on the direction that they are headed to. So if you have vehicles that are going from west to east, we call that eastbound. So this is eastbound movement and we pretty much call this entire approach eastbound approach. So we are going to have southbound approach. We are going to have northbound approach and we are going to have westbound approach. And then when we think about different movements uh, that we can have or different turning movements, we are going to continue or build on what, uh, what we have seen so far. So I'm going to get rid of this 
and let me just focus on eastbound approach so if you have vehicles that are going through we call them eastbound through if you have vehicles on eastbound approach that are making a left turn we call them eastbound left and if you have vehicles that are making a right turn we call them eastbound right so what if we have a lane that has both eastbound through and eastbound right we call it eastbound through right and pretty much the same um, convention is used to call other movements at a signalized intersection so here you are seeing those different movements i have westbound left eastbound left here uh, i have eastbound through westbound through northbound left southbound left and southbound through and northbound through so i have two rings here one on the top and one on one on the bottom i also have something here that i call it a barrier so a barrier is telling us that no movement on one side of the barrier can go with any movement on the other side of the barrier for example if you select movement number two and you select movement number movement number eight so eastbound through and northbound through these two movements cannot go at the same time because they are conflicting so any movement on one side of the barrier cannot go with any movement on the other side of the barrier so we have two rings this is ring number one and this one is ring number two any movement on ring number one can go with any movement on ring number two at the same time as long as they are from the same side of the barrier so what that mean what that means is that for example movement number one can go with movement number five or movement number six it can go with either movement number five or movement number six but it cannot go with movement number seven or movement number eight why because they are on different sides of the barrier and if they go together they are conflicting they're gonna have a crash movement num movement number one can not go with any other movement on the same ring so movement number one cannot go at the same time with movement number two this slide pretty much summarizes everything that we discussed on the previous slide so that you can go back to it and review it on your own this is a very good place to pause and we will continue our discussions from our next class have a good one